Open your Bibles, if you would, please, this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'm going to read verse 8 and 9. Verse 8 and 9. And um, I love this text. This just text really came strong to me uh, this week when I began to just think and pray about what, what we, we, the direction we should head today. And um, so 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 8 and 9. But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. There are many adversaries. The Christian life uh, is never to be stagnant. It's never uh, to be satisfied with status quo. That's why I want to just continue on teaching on more a little bit this morning. Because the Bible is very clear that uh, the Christian life should be a life of growth, a life of progress, that we should grow f- from faith to faith, uh, grace to grace, strength to strength, glory to glory. Um, and so no matter where you're at in your growth cycle, you're probably somewhere in one of those manifestations in your life. Maybe you're in a place right now where you need more faith, because you will be. Uh, this is because we keep progressing in God. And so we grow from faith to faith. And we go from faith to faith and then we go in grace because uh, God is more than willing to give us grace. Amen. And grace comes and strength is supplied and glory is manifested over our life over and over and over and over again in growth cycles. As we grow, as we grow in all of these areas, life itself creates an environment for us to grow. It creates an environment that I must release my faith. It creates an environment uh, where I, I, I need God's grace. I, I must have it, and, and I need God's strength in my life. I must grow. I must grow in faith. I must grow in my understanding of grace. I must grow in strength, and I must grow in the, in the manifestation of glory or the heaviness or the weightiness or the very essence of God himself, which is our ultimate goal, is to know him and to experience him. And, uh, and, and so Paul, Paul talks about it in Philippians chapter 3. And he, and, he, and he says it, he says in Philippians chapter 3, Paul, Paul declares to us, not that I have already attained, but I am already, or, or already perfected, but I press on. Everybody say, press on. That I may lay hold of that which is Christ Jesus and also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, I reach forward to those things that are ahead. I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call or the high call in Christ Jesus. Jesus. And so Paul defines this spiritual growth, this experiencing the more of God. He says that we should be pressing for more. We should be pressing toward the high calling instead of settling for low callings. Remember, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. If there is a high calling, there must be lower callings. And in too many times, we settle. Too many times we become satisfied, and we're satisfied with the lower callings of God around our life. But God is looking for some people who are willing to press. He said, I will not settle for less, but I will press for more. Amen. Somebody say yes. And so the reason it's important that we keep pressing on and don't settle is because it is in the press that we eliminate more of our human nature and we appropriate more of his divine nature. It's simply put, we become more like Jesus and less like ourselves. Yes? So we should be in this pressing towards spiritual transformation. And so this brings us to our text this morning because Paul, it's quite interesting the, the way this, this text is laid out. Um, when, when you really begin reading at verse 5 and you take it through verse 12, it, it's kind of a, a thought. It's kind of a, the, the uh, Paul, the apostle, the great one, is sharing his heart. He's in Ephesus, but he's writing to, to, the, to the church in Corinth. He's writing to some people that he's very close to. And he says, man, I, I really, I really want to come be with you. I'm here in Ephesus right now, but oh, how I, I, I just want to come. He said, I'm going to be passing through Macedonia. This is my plan. Paul is saying, this is my plan. This is my plan. I'm, I'm going to be passing through Macedonia. I'm, I'm going to pass through there. But when I come to you, I want to stay a while. 
I, I, I want to spend maybe the winter with you. I, and, 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 and maybe we could just be together and, 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 and enjoy one another's fellowship and vision and, and grow together. I just, I just need to see you again. Uh, but he said, right now, I'm in Ephesus. But right now, I'm in Ephesus. And he says, I'm going to stay here. He said, I will stay here in Ephesus until Pentecost. He said, I will tarry here until Pentecost. I really would love to come see you right now, but I can't do that. I've got to stay here right now. And, 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 and you, could, you could actually take chapter, uh, verse 8 and 9 out of the, the text, and it would make perfect sense. It would make perfect sense because it's kind of like Paul is talking about what he wants, and then he slips into like this prophetic thing about what God wants. He said, what I want to do is I want to leave here, and I want to go be with you. That's what I want. But he, said, but he says here, I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. And then in verse 10, he starts talking about Timothy and welcome in Timothy and make sure Timothy is taken care of. He's a good man. He's got a great ministry. He's coming to be with you. Oh, I wish I could come be with you, but I can't do that right now. I must tarry here in Ephesus until Pentecost. I must stay here. And he said, the reason I must stay here is there's this great effective door. There's this great effective door that is opened for me here and, and, and he said, but around me are, are, are many adversaries. Around me are many adversaries. Oh, don't forget Timothy. Timothy's coming. Be sure and take care of Timothy, my good brother. I, I, I want you to sense the heart. I want you to feel the placement of where Paul really is. Look beyond just the writing of the words and get into the heart of the apostle. And I see a man that may be a little tired. I see a man that is on his third tour of duty to the mission field. I see a man that has spent the last eight years, two different trips, preaching the gospel, breaking through hard soil, going reaching unreached places. Every city he goes to has not even heard of Jesus, and the gospel has not been preached, but he has broken through every place. He has planted churches. He has ran devils out of town. And now he's on his third tour of duty, and he is in Ephesus. Ephesus was an amazing city. Ephesus was one of the greatest gateway cities uh, in the known world at that time. It was, it was not only a city, it was a region. And here is Paul. And he, he has been here now. We don't really know how long, but he's been there long enough to think, man, I wish I could go see those guys in Corinth. Because now you've got to remember, these guys in Corinth, they were a little. They didn't have it all together. But apparently there was enough there that Paul said, if I could just go back there for a while. If I could just go back there where I've been celebrated. If I could just go back there and see the work of the Lord, uh, see, see how things are going, and see, see, see the fruit of my labor. I, I, I just need a little time to go back. But, but Paul, but Paul is, is, is saying, but I, I, I must tarry here. I must tarry here. I must tarry here. And, and so, so Paul, after eight years, at least eight years, of, of going from city to city, preaching the gospel, starting churches, um, Facing opposition everywhere he goes, and sometimes running for his own life. Now he here is at Ephesus, and he said, I must wait here till Pentecost. When I'm reading that phrase, it seems like to me that Paul is expecting something significant to happen on Pentecost. He's been through a lot of Pentecost. He's celebrated a lot of them. He's a Jew. He knows what that's all about. He knows Passover, Pentecost. He knows Passover. Passover is, 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 is when God had an appointed time to deliver his people. So every Passover, they celebrate redemption and deliverance. They celebrate that. He understood that. And then Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, 50 days is when, God, is when, God, is, is when God's appointed time to open the heavens and pour out blessing upon his people. It's when they, it's when they look forward to uh, resources of the harvest being gathered. It's when they look forward to greater revelation of the Word of God. I'm talking about a Hebrew in their celebration of Passover, uh, their celebration of Pentecost. And it was also a time that they looked forward to because Pentecost was a time when they could expect an outpouring of the presence and the power of God. It was a time when they expected God to do something significant in their life. So Paul said, hey, as much as I would like to take a break, as much as I would like to come see you, I must tarry here and 
until. I must tarry here until. It reminds me of Luke 24, 49. Behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Apparently, Paul was expecting something to happen over Ephesus. Apparently, he had some prophetic understanding that the heavens were getting ready to open and this Pentecost wasn't going to be like the other three Pentecosts he had been through in Ephesus. This time, something significant was getting ready to happen. Yes? So you have to understand out of all Paul's accomplishments, the, his greatest work by far was probably what he did in Ephesus. He raised up one of the greatest churches in world history. And so now Paul is talking about this. I, I must wait here because until Pentecost, because, because, watch this, because there is a great and effective door opened to me. A great and effective door opened to me. Ephesus is opening to the gospel. He's saying what I've been praying for, what we've been believing for all these years now is beginning to happen. I see it. The text is not, it's going to happen. It's happening right now. It's not, there's going to be a door. He said, unto me, a door has been open. It's open right now. It's open uh, right now. And so the gospel is open. The atmosphere of the city is changing. Resistance is crumbling. Uh, Paul's prayers are being answered. The city is being falling to the gospel. Darkness is being driven out. The church is being established. And, 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 and so Paul, Paul is, is saying here, I'm uh, standing right now in the middle of my dream, and as, as tired as I am and as weary as I am and as long as it has taken to get here and how much I would love to come to see all you guys in Corinth, I must stay here. I must stay here because I sense something significant is getting ready to happen. I sense something that has never happened in this city is getting ready to happen in this city. He said it is a great and effective door. It's open to me. That, 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 that word great means mega, massive door, a massive door. You can't miss it. He said it is so huge you can't miss it. Door is a metaphor in this text. Paul is using it as a metaphor because it was a metaphor in their culture, which meant a unique opportunity. A unique opportunity is getting ready to be released to me. A released, uh, or, or has been released to me. You see, we must understand, church, that as the body of Christ and as the people of God, opportunity is everywhere. And what is the opportunity that Paul saw? He saw the fact that there was going to be an effective work done. He saw the fact that there was going to be a release of power and forcefulness and activity. It was coming through the gospel, through the church, and through the power of God. And so not only is there a great opportunity that Paul is talking about, because remember, there is always opportunity. Always. There's always opportunity. There's always things for us to do for God. Paul saw a need. He went to Ephesus because nobody had preached the gospel there yet. He saw a city waiting to hear the gospel even though it was shrouded in darkness and it was deep in debauchery and, 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 and heathenism and it was a dark, dark, dark city. And, but he went there anyway. He went there by himself. He went there. He went there to preach the gospel. He went there to raise up a church. He went there to see uh, God's work done. Among There was a great opportunity, but things shifted. You gotta understand, things shifted. Doors represent new opportunities and shifting seasons and shifting Seasons, And so what we see is there's not only a great opportunity here, but there is an open door, an open door, an open door, great opportunity. You see, when God opens a door into a great opportunity, it's time for action. You see, see opportunities around us. And many times you can wear yourself out trying to get through the door. But when God opens the door, then it's time to do something. Then it's time to activate your faith. Then it's time to step out and do something you've never done before. When God opens a door in your life, get ready for your destiny to expand yes so everything's different now not only is there an opportunity but there's an opportunity with an open door see opportunity is all around us open doors turn potential into reality see our city potentially can be won through a great move of God and through a church that's merely being a real church it's, it's all around us but then when God gives you an open door that potential that is within you becomes a reality. It's, it's, it's potential becoming actual. See, opportunity is our destiny potential. It's who God has designed us to become. It's, per, it's, it's personal and it's corporate. It's, it's destiny potential. 
And so Paul is talking about this fact. He's so excited. He said that the, there's open doors. There's great opportunity. I just feel like things are getting ready to pick up. I just feel like things are getting ready to shift. I see it. I sense it. Uh, all uh, uh, around me and so open doors so he said there's open doors uh, there's great opportunity but he said but then he went on and said but but everybody say but it's all surrounded by opposition <laughs> way to go paul he just ruined the message it's exciting to think about great opportunity. It's exciting to think about open doors. It's exciting to think about things in my life are getting ready to pick up and things I've dreamed of. I'm really beginning to see it happen. The things we prayed so hard for, the prophetic word we've been holding on to and believing and declaring, it, and all the hard work that we put into this thing is getting ready to pick up and getting ready to see the reality of it. And Paul just said, hey, I just got to let you know this. I am standing right in the midst of a great opportunity that is unique like nothing I have never seen before. And I'm standing in the midst of this great opportunity, and it happens an open door and all we got to do is walk through the door and God's going to release some supernatural things and it's going to flood his glory in into a city but he said I have to let you know this it is surrounded by much opposition yes this is important where we're headed today because you see uh, if he would have stopped a great opportunity and opened doors that would have been awesome but he had to bring this opposition thing into there many adversaries the text says hostile forces that are lying around and ready to stand in opposition to pry away the opportunity in order to steal it from us he said there are many he didn't say there was one two three he said there are many there are many that oppose us there are many adversaries see what Paul is wanting us to know is that if you ever dream of being something and doing something significant, there will be a struggle. Paul is giving us insight. Paul's helping us out here. He's giving us the real deal. He's giving us a taste of reality. If you ever, ever want to see something profound happen, he's letting us know that significant advancement and accomplishment in God when you begin to move forward in that, the struggle is real. It's not in your mind. It not just look like it. Struggle is real. Struggle is part of it. Somebody shout the struggle. I just come to give you a good word today. Struggle. Struggle. There will always be struggle. Paul is in the most amazing time in his ministry, and he's seeing his dream and his vision become a reality. But he says in the midst of all of that, there is struggle. In the midst of all of that, I'm struggling through it. In the midst of all of that, I don't know if he was struggling spiritually. I don't know if he was struggling financially. I don't know if he was struggling emotionally. I, I don't know if he was, I don't know what he was struggling in, but Paul was letting us know around me are many oppositions. I, I'm struggling in this moment. I don't know if anybody in this room has ever struggled Except me. I, 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 sometimes I struggle. Sometimes it's a struggle to get up. Sometimes it's a struggle to put your clothes on. Sometimes it's a struggle to get to the work. Sometimes it's a struggle at home. It's a struggle with the kids. It's a struggle in my marriage. It's a struggle with my, it's a struggle with my, but sometimes you just struggle. Religion would like us to think when you struggle, you must be out of God's will. If you struggle, you must be headed in the wrong direction. But I have come to refine that. I have come to let you know if you are moving to a place of significance, get ready. Because a part of significance is struggle. You're going to have to struggle through it. You're going to have to get up when you don't want to get up. You're going to have to preach when you don't want to preach. You're going to have to pray when you don't want to pray. You're going to have to read your Bible when you don't want to read your Bible. You're going to have to go to church when you don't want to go to church. You're going to have to struggle. I wish I could tell you it's all fine. I wish I could tell you get a positive attitude and you'll have a positive life. If you can have all of that, that's awesome. But you've got to understand in the, in the way that God works, there's struggle. The, the, the challenge is that many times when we get in this struggle, we settle. Because the struggle brings growth. But if you're in a struggle, we settle and we don't grow. We just try to get through my struggle. 
If I could just get through this situation, life will be better. You know, life is like a Tupperware bow. You get one side down, and the other side pops up. The moment you think, I got it all together now. I got it all together now. Life's good. You know what? You can be in a time where you should be rejoicing. You should be in a time where you're seeing the great fruitfulness and increase in your life. And everything, you look around you, and man, it's good, but yet you are struggling. Why? Because in the midst of significance, there will be many that will oppose you. There will be opposition that will come against you. Spiritual growth takes place in the soil of opposition. Yes? I'm trying to help somebody because, you see, you can't always stop the struggle. You can't say, well, if I stop here, I'll quit struggling. You just settle for what could have been. I refuse to settle any longer. I have made up my mind. If I got to struggle every day, if I've got to get up and struggle, I would rather struggle than settle for less because there is more. Yes? struggle somebody say struggle see struggle is more beneficial than settling and when God is releasing something new and through around your life then don't be surprised if you struggle what's what our Bible says our Bible says in 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 the first Peter first Peter chapter 4 verse 12 beloved do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you as though watch some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when the glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. What? Another translation says, don't be surprised when struggle comes. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. See, significance requires struggle. But this is what we have to learn. During the struggle, it's always easier to look at the problem than the solution. You understand, if you look up the definition of opportunity, it will, it, 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 some definitions, it will say that it is a problem that cannot be solved. Which means you have an opportunity. It's a problem that cannot be solved. You see, I think it's very interesting that when, when you begin... When you should be rejoicing, and we should be excited about what's happening around us, we focus so much on the struggle that we miss the significance of the moment. And old thoughts and old patterns and behaviors begin to resurface in our life, and it causes us to want to stop and settle. I, I, I want to help you get through the struggle this morning, and I want to help you understand. It's real simple. I just read it to you. And that, that when we're in the midst of the struggle, we cannot allow ourselves to come into agreement with our enemy. We cannot allow ourselves to come into agreement with a negative opposition that is rising against us. We must come into agreement with God's word, which says, Don't think it's strange, but rejoice. You want to tick the opposition off? Rejoice. Rejoice. Look at your neighbor and say rejoice. The key for the struggle is to stay in joy, stay in peace, and let go of doubt. Let go of fear. Let go of insecurities. Let go of all those things. Because I want you to know the struggle is real. But if you can learn to stay in joy, if you can learn, if you can learn to go ahead and look back just a little bit, if you can look back just a little bit, and you can look back and say, okay, I've been, down, I've been in this cycle before. And the last time I was in this cycle, I freaked out. And, but God finally came through and got me out. This time I'm in the cycle again, but this time I'm not going to freak out. This time I want to faith out. And this time, this time I'm not just going to go through a struggle. Ah, uh, get, get ready, get ready to hear what I'm getting ready to say. This time I'm not just going to go through a struggle. This time I'm going to grow into significance. 
We got to stop living on trying just to get through things so I'll be happier and life will be better. And knowing that everything I face, everything I face in life has a purpose and a reason. And if I can go through it and I can grow through it, I will rise to a higher level. And then when I get to it next time, I'll just go ahead and rejoice because I know God is getting ready to do something profound in my life. Yes. The struggle is a sign that something significant is about to happen. And, and, and I, I, I'm being somewhat general in the term of, of the struggle because I, I can't be specific because the struggle is tied to my own significance. In other words, what you struggle with, I may not struggle with. The struggle that comes into my life comes into my life because it's to create significance and it's to create a place in my life of growth that I can help somebody else get out of what I escaped from, what I overcame, what I grew through. And so it's hard for me to say this is the struggle because it, it, it's, it's personal. And many times even it is even corporate, but it is a struggle that God is trying to develop something in, in, in a person or develop something in a church. And so I just come to tell you this morning, keep pressing. Keep pressing. Keep pressing. Uh, keep pressing. And, 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 and you may be in the midst of the struggle this morning. And, and, and I'm going to let you know something. If, you'll, if you will quit trying just to get through it and allow God to grow you in this moment, then you're going to gain something in your life that's going to, to equip and empower you to, to, to uh, stand in a place of significance in the eyes of others. They're going to see growth in you. They're going to see development in you. They're going to see that's somebody that understands what it means to struggle. That's somebody that understands what it means. Even though it's hard, they keep pressing. Even though they want to give up, because you will, but you refuse to, you keep pressing. And even though you may stumble, and even though you may fall in the midst of the struggle, you get back up, and you dust yourself off, and you keep moving forward. I'm talking to somebody in this house that's in a struggle today. I have come to let you know that your struggle is getting ready to turn to significance. Yes. So how do we do this? It's real simple. You ready for this? It's real profound. It's real deep. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've been through cycles and I've been through seemingly the same things over and over again. And this is the terminology we, we use a lot of times when we see this thing coming back up is... You ready? Here we go again. Here we go again. And you fight the same struggle. You deal with the same struggle. You go with the same issue all over the way you did before. You deal with it spiritually. You deal with it emotionally. You deal with it all the same way you did before. Here I go again. But this time. Somebody shout this time. I don't just go through something. I grow through something. What can I grow through? Spiritual growth takes place in the soil of opposition. It, it is a, a fallacy to not understand then when God wants us to grow, he makes us very uncomfortable. So if you're looking for to be comfortable in this little Christian life that we create sometimes, it's all comfortable. But when God wants you to grow, we don't grow unless we get uncomfortable. It's like a baby in a womb of a mama. The reason that baby comes out is because it finally grew to the point that, hey, there's no more room in here for me. And it's time for me to get out. And I'm coming out. As I was thinking about this concept, I had to think about the, the caterpillar and the butterfly. That's not new to us, metamorphosis. 
it, it, it's, 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 it's a parable, you see. It's a story of a little boy that went out in the park and he played. And he was playing around in the park and he found this caterpillar. And he brought this caterpillar to his mom. He was so intrigued by it. I said, Mom, can I take this caterpillar home? Can this caterpillar be my pet? And then she said, sure, fine. I'll let you do that. And so he took the caterpillar home. He got a big jar, put the caterpillar in the jar, put leaves and sticks and stuff in there. and Kind of make it like a little habitat. And he'd, he'd bring little stuff home to feed the caterpillar. And, and one day the caterpillar climbed up one of the little branches that he'd put in the jar. One of the little sticks climbed up there and was kind of freaking out. And the little boy went to his mom and said, I don't know what's wrong with the caterpillar because the caterpillar is freaking out. His mom went in there and said, son, he's getting ready to move into transition. He's getting ready to move from being a caterpillar to a butterfly. And, and he's getting ready to create a cocoon around himself. And, and the little boy was so excited as he began to watch uh, this transformation begin to take place uh, and how around uh, this caterpillar, this cocoon be, was created. And, and then one day, then one day there was a little hole came into the cocoon. And the little boy was watching because he would come home every and watch it. There was a little hole, and that, and that, and he looked in that little hole, and sure enough, there was a butterfly-looking thing down on the inside of there. But that little butterfly was struggling. That little butterfly looked like, man, he was desperate. He could not get out through that hole. And the little boy, he was so concerned he was going to hurt himself. So concerned he needs some help. He needs some help to get out of this cocoon. So he got some scissors and he just snipped a little bit on the hole. As soon as he snipped it, it wasn't too long until that butterfly came up out of that cocoon. But the butterfly wasn't totally developed yet. It had a big body, swole body, and shriveled wings. And he was hoping, he was hoping over time that the, that, that the body would, the, the, would, would, would shrink down and the, that the wings would get stronger, but they never did. They never did. And, 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 and you know why? I'll tell you why. Because, you see, butterflies are supposed to struggle. There's a reason why God only gives them a little hope. Because when they're struggling to get out and they're struggling to soar and they're struggling to fly, when they, when they uh, struggle through that little hole, that little hole begins to push the fluids out of the body into the wings. And then when it comes out through that hole, even though it has to struggle, and even though it becomes desperate, and even though it looks like that, 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 that butterfly is never going to get out of there sooner or later, it, it won't stop. It will, it will get through the struggle. It will, it will, it will keep moving and, and because it understands I've got to get out of here because I've been created to fly. I've been created to soar. And if you leave that butterfly alone sooner or later, it's going to pop up out of that hole. And when it does, its body is not going to be swollen. Its wings are not going to be shriveled. But it's going to be developed in a way that and it can soar through the sky like it was created to soar. And I have come to let you know today, don't give up and don't settle in the struggle. Struggle on because one day you're going to pop out of that cocoon and you are going to soar like you never dreamed you could soar. If you believe that, shout yes. Would you get up on your feet, please? We're seven days away from Pentecost. Paul was longing to leave Ephesus and go be with his friends. But he says, I can't. Until Pentecost comes because I just believe when Pentecost comes, something supernatural is going to happen in my city because a door is opened. I believe a door is open over this house. I believe a door is open over your life. I believe there's many in this room that have been going through the struggle. And many times when we go through the struggle, we beat ourselves up so bad. Like, man, what's wrong with me? Snap out of it. You're bigger, you're bigger than this. You're stronger than this. You Snap out of it. God, take the struggle away. If the struggle doesn't go, that means you've got to struggle on. Because this is a struggle that's creating significance in your life. It's the struggle. Not a lot of people talk about the struggle anymore. So simply put, once again, struggle, don't settle. Because there's more for you. There's more for you. There's more for you. Just all over this house, can you lift your hands? 
I believe there are many today that's in the struggle. Many today that's in the struggle. I wish I could pray and say, let me lay hands on you and I will, will cause the struggle to stop. I can't do that. But I can pray over you and say, let joy come. Let peace come. Let faith come. Let grace come. Let strength come. You got to get out of that cocoon today. Struggle on. Struggle on. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus this morning that there would be grace for the struggle. I pray our faith would grow. That our grace strength would grow. I pray this morning, oh Father, that you would do something profound, deep in our understanding. It's not just an attack, it's an advancement. And I pray this morning that there would be peace deep in our souls. There would be joy in our hearts. And that we would see, O oh Lord, the great things that you are doing. And that there would be power released in the struggle. I thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. 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 The struggle today, if you're in the struggle, I, I, I'm going to ask you to come forward right now real quick. I'm going to ask you to move out of your seat and come forward right now. I say, Pastor, I'm in the struggle. The struggle, it's all around me. Why am I asking you to do this? I'm asking you to step through the door. I'm asking you to step through the door. There's a door, there's a door, there's a door. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah, come on. Come on, yes, come. Come. The struggle, the struggle, the struggle, the struggle. The struggle, the struggle, the struggle. I have been through the struggle many times in my life. Lift those hands. Now, God, I just ask you. For a supernatural strength. God, I ask you to give them a vision. of who and what they are just about to become. And I pray between this week and Sunday that they would be, an, they would be just an outpouring through the door of God over their life. I ask you, Father, to do something supernatural for them, around them, and through them. And I thank you for it. I thank you, Lord, that they're in a growth spurt. And they're going to see phenomenal results take place over their life. And I pray this week there would be an advancement. That there would be a picking up, an acceleration over their life. And I thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Spirit was prompting me to tell you guys that are standing down here that you are greater than the struggle. And it's not in yourself, but it's in Christ who is in you. 
Just lift your hands. Everybody out there, stretch your hands toward them right now. God is moving in this place. Every one of us, whether we're here now or or we've been here, we know we're going to be here again. But this is what the Holy Spirit was saying to tell you. You're greater than this struggle. Come on, I need a church in here to agree with that. Come on. You're greater than this struggle. And it's not you and yourself. It's not your strength. It's the strength of God that's in you. So lift both of your hands. Come on, as high as you can. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak inner strength to them right now. I speak inner strength. Let them be strengthened in their inward man, oh Lord God. Father, I thank you that Christ, the hope of glory, dwells within them. That they are overcomers. They are overcomers, Lord. I know that it feels heavy. I know that it looks impossible. I know that it's confusing. I know that it's not going the way that you thought it should go. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We quote that scripture so much that we really forget the meaning of it. Greater is the treasure of God in you than that one that is coming and fighting against you. I want everyone to begin to pray in the Holy Ghost in the room right now. Because there's some people that are desperate up here this morning. And I don't know if you remember what it's like to be desperate. But I remember what it's like to be desperate. And it hasn't been too awful long ago. But I know that my God has come through for me and your God is going to come through for you because we serve a God almighty and almighty God. These are not cliches that we say. These are promises in the word of God. I want you to lift those hands and I want you to say this with me. I want you to say, I stand on the promise of God. Say, I stand on the promise of God. Every one of you down here, you need to open your mouth. Don't just stand there. You need to open your mouth. And here's the reason why. is because the devil will keep beating us up until we take a stand and we say, I don't have to live like this. I don't have to accept this. Anybody in the room hear what I'm saying? I don't have to accept this. I do not have to accept this. I am a child of God. Come on, lift those hands back up. I'm sorry to have you doing calisthenics up here, but come on. I want you to scream it out. I do not accept this. I am a child of God. I am covered in the blood of Jesus. His presence protects me. He is a shield around about me. He fights for me. He is on my side. And if God is for me, then not anything can be against me. I want you to scream it out. I am an overcomer. Now lift your hands, y'all begin to sing, and I want you to begin to pray and praise the Lord. Today is your breakthrough. Today is your breakthrough. Today is your breakthrough.